Anybody ever had a conversation with someone who's like judging you or accusing you? Like immediately you're like, ah, the wall goes up. Like I don't want to talk to them. You know, I don't want to share this part of my life with them. Like they're not, you know, they're not safe. They're not a safe place for me, right? Uh, so when we sort of have that uh, appearance, when we have that, that posture of, of judgment, uh, it can be very easy for someone to just be like, mm, no, I don't want to talk to them. Like, mm, I, don't, I don't want to talk to the church. I don't want to ask my questions to them because uh, they're, they're judging me. They're not being sincere. They're not being kind. They're not helping me do this. And it leads people to what, uh, what most people are calling deconstruction. Anybody know what spiritual deconstruction is? Show of hands. Anybody? Few of you. Few of you. Uh, just to give you an idea, it's the new word uh, for sort of um, deconstructing uh, your faith and, and sort of stepping away. Um, and, and that's sort of a very crude definition. Um, but Pastor Craig Grishel has a really good definition of this that I, that I just want us to use um, uh, for the basis of this conversation. Um, and so here's what it is. It says deconstruction isn't Oh, excuse me. Deconstruction is a sincere examination of your beliefs, seeking to let go of what is untrue so you can hold on to what is true. So uh, in essence, when people say they're deconstructing, uh, they're trying to seek after truth and they're trying to let go of things that are untrue, okay? Um, And so deconstruction done well in the church, I think, can be a form of discipleship. Uh, And you might be saying, hey, Pastor Jacob, like, people are leaving the church, and you think this could be a good form of uh, discipleship? Like, you lost your mind? Uh, Maybe, but that's a really good question, okay? Uh, Because here's here's what deconstruction does. It, It forces us to examine our core beliefs under a microscope. And so we really have to look at what we believe and then examine if it's true or untrue, right? Uh, because sometimes we don't always get things right in our faith. But here's, here's something interesting. Jesus was the master of deconstructing individuals' beliefs, okay? Because uh, especially here on the Sermon on, on the Mount, okay? Because Jesus five times said this, you have heard it said this way, but I say this way. Now, it doesn't mean that those things were necessarily wrong, but there was a a wrong belief. So Jesus five times says, hey, you've heard it said this way. Well, guess what? I say this. And then he also had to correct the beliefs of of his disciples on uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, But I just want to show you these these two examples in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Matthew 5, 21, it's in your bulletin. And Jesus said, hey, you have heard it said to, to the people who receive the law that those who murder are going to be judged. Well, I say to you, if you are angry at your brother without cause, then you're going to be judged. So basically what Jesus is equating is, hey, uh, murder is wrong, but also hating your brother without cause, being angry at your brother without cause, uh, that is the same thing as murder. It's what's in here as well. And then the same thing applied to lust and, and adultery. Jesus said, you have heard it said, don't commit adultery. But now I tell you, whoever looks at a woman to lust, you have committed adultery with her in your heart. And so Jesus is just like ripping open the scene of, of, of the Jews. And he's just like, hey, you've heard it said this. Actually, it's also this, exposing the belief deep within the core belief in the heart. Because here's what was happening is, uh, you know, uh, Men, even today, uh, they're like, I can look, but I can't touch, you know? Like, that's a common thing you hear. Um, You know, they're married, so they can't commit adultery, but they can sure look at all they want. Jesus says, hey, that's the same thing as adultery. Same thing as, as hate and murder. It's the same thing. And then Jesus had to correct his own disciples about who they thought he was. Because Israel, the Jews, they wanted a military leader. They wanted a conquering king to come in and slay the Romans and and free the Jews and and establish this kingdom in Israel where they would rule and reign. And Jesus said, no, that ain't it. And Peter was a good example of this. He said, uh, this is in Matthew 16. It says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised on the third day. Then Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked him and said, 
Far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. But then Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. And so Jesus had to deconstruct the beliefs of of Peter and and, and then work to reconstruct this idea that Jesus wasn't going to be a conquering king. He was going to be a suffering servant whose blood would be shed for the forgiveness of sin. When we started this building project, uh, there was a bunch of mold in the, in the kids' wing on the walls because it was so old. Uh, so instead of ripping down the building and starting afresh, we simply took the things that needed to be replaced out. Same thing with the, some of the ceiling tiles. Don't look at the ceiling. Uh, we took the ceiling tiles out, we took the walls out, and then we replaced them. The things that needed to go, we replaced and we rebuilt just like Jesus did with the people of Israel that he preached to, with Peter, and with us. We must examine that which is untrue and then replace it with what is true. And that's the core of deconstruction. Uh, So how do we build this belief system, and, and how do we know that it's true, that it's right, that we're actually seeking the truth? Well, how we build the belief system, it's pretty easy. It's the book. It's the Bible. Sermon over. All right? Like, we can just cut it there. But there's a little bit more nuance to it because um, sometimes, there, there, well, not sometimes, all the time, there, is, there are things that sort of help us and lead us in different ways to study the Scripture. Uh, you know, oftentimes, like, your church can sort of dictate how you study the Scripture, your family, even yourself and your beliefs. Like, as a church... We believe that the Bible is inerrant and infallible. And those are two weird words that nobody uses. Um, But inerrant means it's without error, and infallible means it's incapable of being wrong. We also believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture, which is simply just every word in the Scripture was planted there by by the Holy Spirit and is meant to be there. Okay, so these are the presuppositions that we're like reading into this. That's like, okay, this thing is true. It's incapable of error and it has no error. All right. So that's that's what we have. But if if you go to a church uh, that, you know, doesn't take the word as the word and it's like, oh, it's just a good book, you know, uh, then you're likely not going to look at the scripture and say, this is life changing. You're probably just going to say it's a good book, like has good stories in it. And if your family is the same, like, if your family doesn't take the word of God as the word of God, and you spend a lot of time with your family, like, you're also probably not going to look at the scripture as the word of God. You're going to look at it differently. We, we have this question, or we have this answer, how do we form a belief system? It's the scripture. So this is how we combat our doubts. But, but how do we know it's, it's the real stuff? Like, how do we get rid of all the other junk that can sometimes get in there? Here's the answer. We have to look at it through Christ's redemptive plan of love. Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we have to look at the scriptures, at every point in the scripture, the Old Testament law, the prophets, the Psalms, everything as pointing to uh, the, the advent of Christ and his sacrifice. And, and everything in the gospels and the letters is pointing to who Jesus is. And then the book of Revelation as, uh, as to what is coming when Jesus returns. Okay, So this is how we must look at the scripture through the, through the lens of, of Christ's redemptive plan of love for us. That's how we have to look at the scriptures. And 